monarchs arrived on silent wings in the late afternoon sky. As my wife and I stood in the middle of a country road near our home, the butterflies glided overhead with their orange and black wings framed against a fading sky. One followed by another, and another, and another. This went on for twenty minutes as we watched, our necks bent to the sky. The monarchs headed to the trees on our property, gathering by the hundreds in clumps on the mulberries and oaks. Our home was on a migration flyway for the monarchs, and we would welcome them every September as they paused on their long journey to their overwintering sites in central Mexico. They would stay for the night, and in the morning, nectar on the goldenrod and asters and bone set before heading south. This went on for a decade, for nearly as long as we lived in the house, until suddenly it stopped. It wasn't gradual, it didn't taper off, it just stopped to the point that only five, six, seven monarchs would rest in the trees for the night. Nor did we see them the following May, when the monarchs made the journey north. What was happening to them? Where were they? Population studies showed the same thing. Monarchs were disappearing before our very eyes, and I had to wonder whether the monarch was going the way of the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet, two birds that went extinct in the early 1900s in the blink of an eye. We can save the monarch butterfly. We have all of the ability to save, save the monarch butterfly. We shouldn't lose this migration, but we could. And we could if we don't mobilize to do this effectively. We could if we get in our own way by putting rules and regulations in place that don't allow us to do the effective things that we need to do to save this butterfly. So, you know, will we, won't we? I don't know, but shame on us if we don't. It is clear from all the scientific data that habitat loss, especially the loss of milkweed, is the most likely cause of the huge decline in monarch numbers. If the trends continue, will we lose the monarch along with all the other threatened butterflies, bees, and birds of the tall grass prairie? things about the monarch butterfly is that it, it's symbolic for what we're doing to our habitat in general. So if we see the monarchs go down, that means the pollinators are going down, it means the plant diversity is going to be going down, it means the birds are going down, those ground nesting mammals are going to be going down, and the birds of prey are going to be going down. I mean, it, this is, you know, the monarchs are simply a symbol for what is happening negatively to all of the things that share the same habitat. So if we bring back the monarchs, and we restore the habitats for monarchs. We are, in effect, going to restore the habitats for all of these other species. This is a map of a landscape that no longer exists. The tall grass prairie covered 170 million acres and stretched from southern Canada to southern Oklahoma. The tall grass prairie was the last ecosystem to develop in North America about 8,000 years ago and the first to be nearly completely obliterated. Today, the rich soil of the prairie has been turned into millions of acres of row crops. As far as the eye can see, Iowa and Illinois, the two states with the largest expanses of prairie, today have less than one-tenth of one percent of original prairie remaining. They have the most changed landscapes in North America and look nothing like they did 200 years ago. Millions of acres of wetlands and glacial ponds were drained and turned into drainage ditches, now best known for their algae blooms that take place because of the fertilizer runoff from agricultural fields. That fertilizer and herbicide-rich water ends up in rivers and lakes and eventually in the Gulf of Mexico. The monarch cannot survive without milkweed, 
It is the only plant on which the monarch lays its eggs and the only food source for the caterpillars. In the Midwest, with the tall grass prairie ecosystem erased by row crops, one of the few places for milkweed and other native nectar flowers to grow is along roadsides. The plants are easy for monarchs to find and take advantage of for egg laying. And for those farmers who insist on mowing roadsides, and most do, the monarch pays the price. Thousands, if not millions of monarch eggs and caterpillars are lost every year to mowing. The same is true for other helpful insects and grassland birds. Planting roadsides, filter strips, and marginal land in native prairie flowers could go a long way in boosting the populations of pollinators and grassland birds. We have to change our ideas of what a landscape should look like. Butterflies, bees, and other pollinators overwhelmingly prefer native prairie flowers like milkweed, bergamot, prairie blazing star, and goldenrod over annuals like petunias, mums, and geraniums. The monarch's migration is time to the blooming flowers of asters, goldenrod, and boneset. A green expanse of lawn or roadside mowed to look like a golf course is a lifeless void, a landscape without its most colorful creatures. One of the things to be concerned about is that we have destroyed a lot of the native vegetation out there and that native vegetation had a purpose. It really did. It, it supported a lot of biodiversity. Now this is the way it works. You've got native plants they're supported by pollinators. Pollinators are a keystone group of insects. The pollinators provide the pollination services that produce the fruits, nuts, berries, and seeds that um, allow these plants to persist. You take the pollinators out of the system and your biodiversity goes down. If your biodiversity goes down, the insects that feed on those different plants out there uh, are no longer there. And you don't have the food for the ground nesting birds and other, even the seed eating birds, uh, once you've lost your pollinators. So, it's really key to support the pollinators in the system because the pollinators have the effect of supporting all of these other things. All of the plants themselves, the things that feed on the plants, and the things that feed on the things that feed on the plants. I mean, there's, there's a kind of a cascading sort of relationship here that people simply don't understand. We need to understand all of that because that larger system out there, 70% of which is pollinated by insects, supports us. You know, it's fundamentals, you know, that, that we simplify systems at our peril. If we simplify the systems, we end up going as they're doing in some parts of China, which is hand pollinating some of their crops. Now, we don't want to get to that point. I know the traditional way, I, I, I believe that it's not very sustainable. It's beautiful, it's fleeting. And when I say traditional, I mean large commitment to annual flowers, and a large commitment to very uh, non-native species. So you, you really know what you're going to get with those, but it's a shorter season. I think it's important to show that you can achieve some of the same prettiness, the same aesthetics with native plants, or the park district thinks this. Um, and I think it, it just tells a better story. It, the the exotics, the annuals, beautiful, very beautiful, short season, very visual story. I think natives do the same thing and then just tell a far more substantial story about, you know, us. One of those places where the story of native habitat is being retold is the Champaign Park District's Porter Park. The 38-acre park is a former cornfield that now has 27 acres of reconstructed prairie habitat. The park represents a trend throughout the Midwest to recreate the native tall grass prairie. While park systems have always had multiple missions, from recreation to fitness to education and the arts, there is a renewed emphasis on natural areas and wildlife. As we become a more urbanized society and spend more time in traffic, in the workplace, and inside four walls, we are losing our connection to nature. 
Natural areas and the animals that inhabit them bring us satisfaction and joy because they connect us to the outdoors and the essence of what it means to be human. On a hike around Porter Park, you might see monarchs mating, a goldfinch eating bergamot seeds, or a male red-winged blackbird protecting its territory. And what's, what I love about that park uh, is it, it offers the, the most natural areas, the natural elements that you can get. And it also has your, your traditional park amenities. It, it has the playground, it has uh, the shelters, it has the, the hard paths. So it's really within the same views, and this, this is what I really want to see in all of our parks, with landscaping wise within the same view shed you can see the natural areas but you can also see more traditional elements because I, I know there are people that will forever love those things but it's just wonderful to show that we can do both um, and that at the same time we are helping the pollinators the birds that would you're, you're right, when that was corn or when that was beans, I, I bet there, weren't, there wasn't a big assortment of birds visiting that. While parks are obvious choices for recreating and restoring native tallgrass prairie habitat, so are the roadsides of highways and interstates. State departments of transportation are now starting to mow around and plant prairie flowers like milkweed and native asters which are crucial to the continued survival of the monarch and other pollinators, as well as grassland birds. These are habitats and landscapes that most people are not used to seeing, and the transition from short, grassy roadsides will take time. It's not going to look the same, so if you want this, and people do, if you want us to build more habitat and for our right-of-way to be native prairie and to be restored and to be habitat areas, it's going to look different. It's, it's going to look different. And we're going to have to figure out different ways of managing. A stereotype of the prairies that needs to be corrected is that they are an impenetrable wall of grasses. Actually, there were many different types of prairie and many were filled with vivid flowers that changed with the seasons. Those prairies supported a multitude of wildlife, from white pelicans in the wetlands, to bison, to dragonflies, and so much more. The monarch butterfly is a symbol of what's gone wrong with our native habitat, but also how things can be made right again with some effort. What we've already demonstrated with our monarch way stations is that they are effective in bringing in both pollinators and monarch butterflies. And so you create the habitat and they will find it, and they will use it. They might not use it immediately and they might not use it every year, but uh, they will use these resources uh, and these resources will support the part of the population. And, you know, if we can demonstrate it in a small number of these locations we can demonstrate it also in a larger number everybody should be involved i mean it's very clear on the monarch issue that in order to sustain this migration it's kind of an all hands on deck thing we're going to have to use all the habitat available i fly over cities and i look down and other people look down they as other people look down they see cities they see buildings and so on and so forth and roads and what have you and i look down and i see habitat I see potential. I see the possibility of creating a lot of habitat that pollinators can use, that birds can use, uh, that, uh, that can be uh, developed not only for those organisms, but our own pleasure, our own enjoyment. Um, who doesn't like to have birds around? You know, there are a whole lot of places in this world right now where birds just virtually don't exist because there are too many people and we haven't provided the habitat for them. We can't let that really happen here. Any, any improvement that we make 
is an improvement. If we do nothing, right, we stay right where we were. So any little, if we convert one acre, it's an improvement, I guess, if you look at it that way. Um, we're trying to first go after a little low hanging fruit, you know, what's easily um, protectable. So from outside mowing, from our mowing and high visibility areas, that's what the department will go after first. So along with the north-south migratory routes, how much of a difference we can make yet to be determined. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to say um, what our impact can be, but like I said, if we can make any impact, it's, it's more than we were doing before. All around the state, we have always, when the opportunity presented itself and funding and resources were available, we try to put back in native habitat where we could. Um, and then it's, it's dependent on funding and budgets and many things, you know, geography, lots and lots of things specifically with the pollinator and monarch habitat reconstruction areas, we're, we're looking at it two ways. One is preservation and one is reconstruction. So what do we already have out there that we can save? Or what do we already have out there that we can save and enhance and have a really good habitat? And those exist. A lot of those are already in place at our rest areas. A lot of our infield, interstate infield areas um, still have habitat areas that were restored at one point or were put in originally with native prairie. So we're looking at those areas right now as how can we protect those and enhance them to, like I said, turn that into really good habitat. Further beyond that, we're looking at areas, um, we'll probably start with our interstate rest areas. What can we do there? Are there areas that we're currently mowing that can be converted to habitat because they're highly visible? Um, and easy for the public to see and something that IDOT can show, you know, look, this is, this is what we're doing. Here's an example, and this is why we're doing it. So it becomes an educational process for us as well. And the public likes to see stuff and our goal is to get them out, keep them safe, show them what's around at the rest area. So those are areas that we're looking at. We're gonna put in um, Monarch Way stations. So you'll start seeing those pop up as we get them built. Several, probably eight or 10 got built last year agriculture, because of its sheer size and scale, has had the biggest impact on the loss of native habitat for pollinators and grassland birds. But by the same token, it can be the biggest game changer when it comes to boosting the animal populations of the prairie region. That means not mowing roadsides, using filter strips planted with native flowers to help control erosion, and putting marginal land back into native habitat. Nancy and Doug Smith of a rural farmer city, Illinois, are a farm couple trying to do their part in giving a helping hand to pollinators and other animals of the prairie. That's one of the things that actually started was about four years ago when I was out walking. I found a couple milkweed plants in the ditch and I said, hey, I found these. Can you not mow those off when you mow? And so that's what kind of started, really started it was I found these in the ditch. And so and found out you can't really transplant milkweed. I didn't try, but I found out it has a big tap root, yeah. and I couldn't do that. So so I took my $60,000 rig, and I would go up <laughs> and, and around it, and then I'd kind of back up a little bit. Uh, True love. Nancy is using native plants for pollinator gardens around their homestead, and the couple are letting patches of milkweed grow near some of the outbuildings. As a result, Monarchs are laying eggs that become caterpillars and then butterflies. When she said she wanted to plant anything that you know has weed in it, we we're like, no, no, I'm a farmer. I'm, you know, I spend you know a lot of money keeping the weeds out. But um, when I was young, we must have got a million milkweeds. You know, they were very common, and uh, they're easily controlled. I mean, if they get in the field, they don't. Yeah, and they don't really cause much problems anymore. But uh, yeah, I kind of kind of miss the milkweed. <laughs> we grew up with them, and 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 uh, you know, with the advent of Roundup Ready beans, uh, they just went away. And you know, you find them in the ditches and everything. But uh, you know, out in the field, you know, you don't see milkweed anymore. Now that the ditches around Doug and Nancy's farm are no longer being mowed. Native wildflowers and grasses are growing, providing a habitat corridor for pollinators and grassland birds.
there's no money in mowing. I mean, you know, you take a $50,000 tractor and an $18,000 mower and you go off through there wasting fuel and time and tearing up things. And, uh, you know, the, you don't make a, a nickel more from doing that. You know, I know several farmers around that would love to not have to mow the roadside so much and just maybe clip them once a year. Um, and as far as, you know, it's a lot of wear and tear on equipment. Uh, you can throw bottles into the tires or tractors and it, it's not a, it just costs you money. And uh, so if we could get away from mowing all these roadsides, I think it would be a positive thing. Annis has taken a big step toward helping pollinators and birds through a special conservation program offered by the National Resources Conservation Service, a part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He recently planted 80 acres in pollinator habitat. Two years ago, I uh, quit farming, and uh, we were going to rent, cash rent the ground out. And uh, we, I had heard uh, some uh, uh, people talking about the pollinator program through the NRCS and I went and explored the possibility of putting some acreage in pollinator and I actually found out that uh, there was a better cash rent payment on the pollinator program than I could get from farming the letting the ground be farmed out by another farmer in the area so it was kind of a uh, I wanted to do this for reasons of uh, you know encouraging the uh, bees and uh, also it was from a financial standpoint that I decided to put some acreage in the pollinator program. I, yes, I think there's definitely a trend to participate in it. A lot of the farmers are taking their highly erodible ground and, and that's what I did. I took some highly erodible land uh, that I had been farming and there was a problem with soil erosion and this way the ground is always has a cover crop on it don't have to worry about erosion, and it is uh, encouraging wildlife and encouraging the bee population at the same time. So it's, it's a win-win situation, really, I feel like. But you don't have to be a farmer or a big landowner or manage parks or roadsides to make a difference in the population of monarchs and other pollinators. The effort need only be as big as your heart, because even a small backyard pollinator garden or plot at a school or church or nursing home will help grow the pollinator population. Po point about this is that the uh, native plants are just so much more valuable to all the pollinators and to all the other, uh, they're an important part of the ecology. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we need those. Jim Fay of Urbana, Illinois is an example of what can happen when a vacant plot of land is planted with native wildflowers. Fay helped to start the Intercounty Prairie Garden located in the back lot of the United Methodist Church in Villa Grove, Illinois. In a few short years he's seen the pollinator garden attract a variety of wildlife. I would really encourage uh, schools and nursing homes to do something like this. I mean, if the church is interested in it, more power to them, that's terrific. But for a church, for a school and a nursing home, the payoff could just be huge in uh, what a learning uh, experience it could be for the students and for what a, a, oh, what a wonderful thing it can be for the nursing home that the people can go out and walk through this, uh, you know, the, all of these uh, plants. It's not just, you know, most of the commercial plants, hey, it's a, it's, a, it's a big, impressive bloom that you buy at Walmart in the spring and stays the same way, all, you know, all year. With this, it changes every Every week it's a different garden to walk through. And it's not just blooms, it's leaves and, you know, and blooms, of course. And, of course, uh, butterflies and bees and hummingbirds and birds. And uh, 
I would think that would be a wonderful asset for a, uh, a nursing home, that the people could go out and sit in a park bench and partake of nature. Thousands of people across the United States and Canada have planted pollinator gardens with native flowers to help the monarch as well as the other butterflies and bees. I've been involved in monarch conservation for more than 20 years and I've never seen this much enthusiasm. The monarch is big, it flies slow, it's easy to spot with that eye-catching orange color, and of course it migrates thousands of miles to overwinter. So it's an easy butterfly to love. I've never before um, seen anything that brought this many people and this many groups and varied groups together to work on one concept. It's, it's an unbelievable effort that's going in statewide and really regionally, region-wide, as other states are having the same input. Can you actually tell people that we want to save uh, these small bees that are essential pollinators, will they key in on that? No, they're going to key in on the monarch butterfly. They want to save the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly is going to bring in um, and going to save, de facto, a lot of other species. My worry is whether there is enough time to save the monarch and all the endangered animals of the tall grass prairie. The prairie chicken was once one of the most common birds in Illinois and numbered in the millions. Now it's down to less than 200 and could disappear in a moment's notice. I've traveled through tens of miles of central Illinois without seeing a single milkweed, without seeing any native vegetation at all. Tens and tens of miles and so many of the areas that I've driven through, the distance between the edge of the road and the edge of the field is only three or four feet and there's nothing but a few grasses growing in there. That's not a way to sustain wildlife. That's not a way to sustain uh, native habitat. We, we need to do better than that, and we can do better than that. Uh, but, you know, we have competing interests here. We have the economic interests, which value every square foot for what it can produce. And then you have the, the interests, which we should also be adhering to, that we need to maintain the integrity of the system. Well, that's a harder sell in our culture. I'm working with uh, Native American tribes in Oklahoma, and that's an easy sell with those tribes. They value the land and they value the land differently. So they have respect for the land in a way, an appreciation for the land and an appreciation for the things that grow in the land and what the land produces that uh, I'm not seeing among a, a lot of the, the economically driven culture that we have. It's important because uh, nature, I think one thing is we have as a society and mankind is kind of put the hurts to butterflies so we should try to help them you know and I just love I've always loved nature and uh, flowers and so I think to incorporate the two you know and just it just gives it's just a joyous thing to watch them you know if, if you can see them from beginning to end like from the egg all the way up to the butterfly it's even better because you can just think about you know how that process works and everything that has to go right and to think that you can have a little bit of participation in that by doing the right thing, you know, planting the right things and having those available to them just to help, help see the cycle. Can we create a landscape for life for the monarch and all the other animals of the tall grass prairie? What if we're too late? How would you feel if you saw the last monarch butterfly? What would you do? to saving the migrating population of the monarch and all the other endangered pollinators and grassland birds is habitat. We will never get back the 170 million acres of the tall grass prairie. That's unrealistic. Nor is anyone asking for that. But if we can put enough roadsides and filter strips and marginal land and even backyards into native wildflowers to create wildlife corridors and habitat, then the future is hopeful for all the animals of the tall grass prairie.